Hebrews chapter number 10, I'll shut up and start preaching now, okay? I can't even get an amen out of that. There we go. That's the biggest amen I'll get all day. Besides when I stop preaching. Hebrews chapter number 10. I find it funny that the Lord has pressed upon my heart this passage this morning. And uh, when I take a look around, um, I know there's lots of people that are out on vacation and things of that nature. And uh, I am not saying that it is not good to get away every now and then. Amen. Because it's certainly a good thing to get away every now and then. Uh, and take a vacation, spend some time with your family and all of those sorts of things. Um, but a uh, familiar verse this morning, Hebrews chapter number 10. I will be in verse 25, but I want to start in verse number 19. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 19. And the Bible says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad we have access to the holiest place? Amen. Uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ. If you remember in the Old Testament with the tabernacle, um, there was a veil, a very, very thick veil that separated the holy place from the holiest of holy places there as mentioned. And once a year the high priest would go in behind that veil and offer the appropriate sacrifice for the sins of all of Israel. But we do not have to do that today. Instead, the Bible says, therefore let us come boldly unto the throne of grace to find help. Amen. And uh, so we have access to go boldly to the throne. It's not hidden. It's now made nigh by the blood of Jesus. In verse 20 it says, And by a new and living way which He hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say His flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God. And because we have that, notice in verse number 22 he says, the writer of Hebrews writes, and says, Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Verse 23, let us hold fast to profession of our faith without wavering. For He is faithful that promised. Amen. If there's ever a time in the history of the church, might I add to you today that it is more important today than it has ever been that we hold fast the provision of our faith without wavering. Amen. Listen to me. Uh, if there's ever a day and a time that the devil has done everything that he can to deceive Christians and deceive the church, it is today. Amen. And he has got the church buying off and believing in things that are not true, that are unbiblical. He has gotten us to compromise our faith, our beliefs, amen. But as the writer of Hebrews here tells us, he says, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised, amen. He's faithful to us. We should be faithful to him, right? Verse number 24, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Here's our passage this morning, a familiar passage. You all know it, hopefully. <laughs> Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see that day approaching. As you see that day approaching. Approaching And Father, I just pray for a few moments this morning, Lord, that you would open our, minds, open our minds and clear our hearts, Lord, that we would hear your word, Lord, that we would meditate on your word, that we would apply it to our lives, to our hearts. And God, show us the importance of not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And God, we just ask that you'd bless everything that's done here today. Lord, that you would bless the preaching of your word. And God, most importantly, I pray that if there's one amongst us this morning that does not know you as Savior, Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would convict their heart, show them the need that they need to be saved. And God, that they would hear the words that you would place in my heart and in my mouth, Lord, that they would need to hear, that would draw them to you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that they would make the decision to follow Christ as their Savior. And God will praise you. We'll give you all the glory. Lord, we love you and we thank you for everything and your goodness, your mercy, your grace, your love, your caring, your compassion, your kindness. And God, we just thank you for everything. 
In Jesus' name. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. In 1972, Amen. Anybody in here a 1972 model? Don't raise your hand. But uh, if you are, in 1972, uh, according to Pew Research, 92% of Americans claimed to be Christian. 92% claimed to be a Christian. Now this is just in 1972, amen. Now when I get to thinking about 1972, um, I start thinking, man, that's old, ain't it? 1972? And then I get to thinking, wait a minute, I'm not too awfully far from there. And uh, anyways, now we're way on the other side of, of, of the 20s. And uh, 1973 is about as close to, what did they say? I seen a saying the other day, it said 1970 is as close to, to 2020 as like 1940 is or whatever. And I got to think, I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, but uh, anyways, in 1972, according to Pew Research, 92% of Americans claimed to be a Christian. Amen. Y'all probably read and heard a lot of these same statistics. In 2020, another um, study was done um, by Pew Research. And in 2020, only 62% of Americans said or claimed to be a Christian. So that's a drop of roughly 30% in about 50 years, right? In about 50 years. Now, they go on to predict, Pew Research predicts that by 2070, 2070, the number that claim to be Christian in America, and again, I don't know, maybe they're bored enough, they go around asking everybody. I don't know where they get these statistics, but I think they do a sampling amongst all kinds of different categories and things. But uh, they predict that in 2070, or in other words, another 50 years, that the number will be down around 30% of Americans who claim to be a Christian. Now think about that, 30%. Uh, right now, as in 2022, 2023, whatever year this is, 2023 we're on, right? Uh, 2023, even after, uh, as most of y'all know, even after uh, the pandemic or COVID or whatever you'd like to call it, um, even our numbers dropped even more significantly to most churches, and most churches have not recovered from uh, what uh, COVID did. A lot of people, you know, closed churches and things like that, and it actually dropped the number down about three to four more percent, depending on whose research you look after. But uh, the bottom line is, is that the number right now in 2023 is at about 49 percent of Americans who claim to be a Christian. Amen. It's the lowest number that we have ever had in the history of our nation. Amen. 49 percent. And they predict that within Another 50 years by 2070, amen, I hope the rapture happens by then, but uh, in another 50 years by 2070, that that number will go down to approximately 30%. Now think about that, 30% of Americans claiming that they are Christian, amen, 30%. Now, the last time I checked, what's the population of America nowadays? I, I, last time I stopped paying attention, it was like 370 million, something like that, 380 million that we count, right? Um, and there's probably 370 million that we don't know about, right? But uh, that's a side fact. But let's just say 400 million people. Well, I'm not a math major, amen. That's why I had to major in recess because I never was good at math. But uh, some of y'all will get that later. But nonetheless, uh, I got a minor in lunch. Well, y'all tough crowd today, amen. <coughs> That's better than some of the degrees they hand out today, underwater basket weaving and stuff, right? But uh, anyways, um, uh, but uh, I don't know what 30% of 400 million is, but uh, I can tell you that that's a lot less than what it is today. Amen. And uh, so the fastest growing group, anybody want to take a shot about the fastest growing group as far as a religious category, if there is one uh, amongst uh, those that they interviewed or whatever the case was, anybody want to take a shot? What? The Muslims, that's the fastest growing religion in the world, yes. But in America, it's the nuns. Not N-U-N-S, but N-O-N-E-S. Amen, the nuns. The atheist and the agnostic. Atheist means that they do not believe in God. Agnostic just means that they just really don't believe in anything. They don't really know what they believe in. Amen. 
But uh, the nuns is the fastest growing group in America. Amen? And uh, so 30%, think about that, 30% of Americans by 2070 is what they predict that will claim to be a Christian. Amen? Now some of y'all look surprised, but you shouldn't. You say, why? Because the Bible predicts such. Right? The Bible predicts such. Now come back to our passage this morning. Notice in Hebrews chapter number 10, look in verse number 25. He says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. And I looked up the word forsaking or forsake. It means to quit or to leave entirely, to depart from, renounce, or reject. Amen. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approach it. Amen. Can I just go ahead and throw this out there to you this morning that uh, uh, um, the, the Lord is very passionate about His church. Amen. The Lord cares about His church. The Lord loves His church. Amen. And when I say church, I'm talking about the people, right? I'm not talking about the buildings or any of that other kind of stuff. But the Lord gave Himself for the church. Amen. And uh, so number one this morning, we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together because the Lord gave Himself for His church. Notice in Ephesians chapter number 5, Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 25. Notice what the Bible says, Ephesians 5, verse number 25. Paul writes and he says this, he says, Husbands, love your wives, right? Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. Amen? The church. And gave Himself for it. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Amen. Now think about this. The Lord did not just come to give Himself for any old thing. Amen. He didn't just come and have no purpose in the world or no reason that He come. But the Lord came and He loves His church so much that even Paul makes a, a similarity between husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church. Amen. And not only did He love the church, but He gave Himself for it. Amen. Amen. Now, I don't know about y'all, but if the Lord loves something enough that He was willing to give Himself for it, then what does that tell us about what we should do or be? Amen. Christ loved His church and He gave Himself for it. That's pretty important. That's pretty, uh, pretty phenomenal when you begin to think about that, right? If the Lord gave Himself, then what should we do? He gave Himself for His church. You know what we should do? Then we should give ourselves not only to the Lord, but we should also take that much care and that much love and attention. Think about it. If, if the Lord showed that much love and attention and care that He's willing to die and give Himself for His church, then what do you think He expects from us? Amen? Come to 1 Corinthians chapter number 16 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. You all alright this morning? 1 Corinthians chapter number 16. Look at verse number 15. Paul again writing to the Corinthians. Notice what he writes here in verse number 15. He says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Achaia. And notice what they have done, the house of Stephanus. Notice what they've done. And that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know what they did? If you go on and you read a little bit further, they actually had a house church. Amen. They had a church in their house, a gathering of believers. They were willing to give of their possessions of what God had blessed them and given them with. And they had a church in their home and the Bible says that they had addicted themselves to the ministry 
of the saints. Amen? They, they, they devoted, they, they were dedicated, they devoted their entire life to serving the saints. Now think about that, amen? Now we have a lot of addictions today, right? We, we, we talk about addictions. Everybody's addicted to something nowadays, right? And a lot of that is planned out, whether you believe that or not. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I'm telling you money right, is the root of all evil, and money is the driving horse behind 99.99% of all of it. You wonder why people are so uh, addicted to prescription drugs nowadays. Well, number one, I'm going to tell you that doctors don't do anything nowadays, amen. All they do, you go to the doctor, they hear you for about two seconds, and they say, here, take some pills. And then what happens? You have people that, that uh, begin to depend upon these pills and create addictions and all of these things. And now you all see how it has ballooned in the last probably 10 years. Prescription drugs is, is, the leading, um, is the leading drug or the drug use that is out there today. Amen. People uh, 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 are, are, are addicted to illegal drugs, right? Cocaine and meth and... and uh, <coughs> <laughs> I was talking to some folks, uh, uh, some of the Bright Speed executives last week, and uh, we've been down building the city of Clarendon uh, in south, uh, way down in the south. Well, I guess, yeah, it's still south uh, east Arkansas. Uh, but we've been building the city of Clarendon, and uh, I was down there, uh, I think, week before last, and while we was down there, I saw a guy, he was walking by and he was looking, to see what kind of cable it was that we had on our reel and to see what kind of cable that it was that we was hanging. And I said, it's not copper, man. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm saying? Amen. But he was looking to see if it was copper that we was hanging. You say, why? Because there's people that are so strung out on drugs, man, they'll go rip copper out of air conditioners or lines. They'll, they'll take it out of whatever they can find just so they can go sell it so they can get more drugs. You say, why? Because they're addicted. Right? Now, I have my own addictions, too. I'm just going to go ahead and throw this out there. I have my own addictions, too. Any of y'all know where Kirby Quick Stop's at? <laughs> Claire, you know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. I have discovered that Kirby Quick Stop has a soft serve ice cream machine. Amen? Now, every time I find myself going by Kirby Quick Stop, my truck automatically does this towards Kirby Quick Stop. Make a long story short, I may have eaten in the ballpark of eight or ten ice creams this week. <laughs> Amen? I can't help it. They're good. You say, what is it? I'm addicted. Amen? I like them. They're good, ain't they, Claire? Back me up. See, she says she backed me up. She came out there yesterday after we got done skating, right? Them ice creams are good. Did your mom ever get an ice cream? No? That's no fun, huh? Well, at least Claire knows what I'm talking about. But uh, Graceland knows what I'm talking about, too. She stopped by there and got one, too, on the way home. It's your fault. Huh? We did, too. It's your fault. Yeah? Well, you know, misery loves company. <laughs> if I'm going down, I'm taking everybody with me. <laughs> but we have addictions, right? These folks were addicted to the ministry of the saints. Why? Because they knew and they understood and they did not take for granted that the Lord loved His church and gave Himself for it. Amen? They loved the saints. They loved the people. Amen? They addicted themselves to the ministry of of the saints. Come to Ephesians chapter number 3 real quick. Ephesians chapter number 3, number 2 this morning. Can I say this this morning? False teaching has permeated our churches today. False teaching has permeated our churches today. You say, what are you talking about? This is what I keep hearing. Amen. And some of you may not agree with this, and that's okay, but I'm going to show you what the Bible says. Amen. 
the false teaching that is so adamant in our churches and among professing Christians so called today is, is that you can love the Lord but not have anything to do with His church. That is absolutely unbiblical. Amen. Amen. That is absolutely unbiblical. If the Lord loved the church, His church enough that He is willing to give Himself for it. If the Lord thought it was that important that He is willing to give Himself for it, then what makes us think that we're any different? Right. I've been seeing this thing going around on Facebook and it just kind of aggravates me, but it's the devil behind it nonetheless. But it says, well, I don't go to church, but I love the Lord. Listen to me, if you love the Lord, you'd go to church. Amen. Why? Because the Lord loved, loved His church and gave Himself for it. You say, what are you talking about? Watch this. How does the Lord get glory? Anybody want to know? Look at Ephesians chapter number 3. How does the Lord get glory? Let me just go ahead and say this, that yes, God does use individuals at times. Amen? But God does not get glory through individuals. God does not get glory through the ministry of Ben Derrick. Amen? That wouldn't do him very much good at all because Ben Derrick ain't very good. Right? But you have all of these paraministry type things where the person is the only one that is getting the glory and God's getting none of it. But let's see what the Bible says how God gets glory. Ephesians chapter number 3, look at verse number 21. I'm in Ephesians 4. No wonder that don't look right. Watch Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 21. Unto Him, unto Him, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, unto Him be glory in a bunch of individuals. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. Instead, the Bible says, unto Him be glory, how? In the church. In the church. By Christ Jesus how long? Not just in the first century, not just in the second century, not just in the 20th century, but notice what he goes on to say, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. And see, even Bible preachers amen themselves every now and then. Amen, amen Paul said. But how does he receive glory? He receives the glory through his church. Amen? So if I don't need the church and I don't need God and, you know, all of this other kind of stuff, well, I don't need God's church to have, have uh, uh, to need the Lord and everything else. Well, let me tell you something. The Lord, the Lord sure thinks mighty of his church. Amen? The Lord sure thinks a lot of his church. That not only would he give himself for it, but that he would have glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Amen? Think about it like this, and I always say this. <clears throat> Whenever I do something, now I'm just giving you an example. I'm not trying to puff me up or put me on a pedestal. But this is what I try to do. I always try to do it on behalf of the church or from the church. I don't never say, oh, this is from Ben Derrick. Because when I say, oh, well, this is from Ben Derrick, guess who gets the glory? I do. Amen? I don't want the glory. I want him to have the glory. How does he get the glory? He has, gets the glory through his church. Amen? So whenever I do something, I say, this is on behalf of the church, or this is from the church or whatever the case was. Even if I did do it by myself, I want the church to get the glory. Why? Because when the church is glorified, He's glorified. Amen. Amen? Now don't misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you got to go to church to be saved. Amen? That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm not saying you've got to be a member of a church to be saved. Amen? But what I'm saying is, is that if you're truly saved, you'll want to have fellowship. Amen? One of the greatest evidences that you've truly been born again according to John in 1 John, 
right? Is that you have love for the brethren. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm just going to be flat out honest with you because I understand the truth and the reality. I know it. I've seen it. Trust me, I've been there. I know. The reality of it is, is yes, the church can be rotten. Amen? You can get hurt from the church. Amen? Church people aren't nice sometimes. Amen? Church people lie and do things they shouldn't do sometimes. Amen? Amen. I'll say it if nobody else does. Hallelujah. Where rotten is, the day is long. But we're not here to worship each other. We're here to worship Him. And you know all a church is? All a church is is a bunch of undeserving people, a bunch of undeserving sinners coming together not to glorify each other or ourselves, although I've seen a lot of churches that that's all they do is glorify self. But we don't come here to glorify self, amen. We come here to glorify Him. Amen. God, we are rotten. God, we do make mistakes. God, we do fall short. God, we do do things that we don't do. God, we, we do things we don't do, and we don't do things we should do, right? Just as Paul said. But listen to me. We're not here. You're not here to worship me. You're not here to worship the deacons. You're not here to worship Brother Tony. Amen. You're not here to worship Brother John. And let me tell you, the quickest way that you can ever get discouraged at church is to start looking around at everybody else. Amen. But let me tell you, we do not come to church to look around at everybody else. And if you do, then you're wrong. You say, why? Because if you find yourself looking around in church, listen to me, you're going to get discouraged real fast. Amen. And you're going to want to quit because you're going to say, well, that preacher, he ain't perfect. Amen. I've got news for you. I'm not perfect. And I've never claimed to be perfect. I've always said I'll mess things up more than I ever get things right. Amen. Listen to me. I'm imperfect. Amen. But can I share with you this morning that although that I'm imperfect but I serve a perfect God. Amen. And I'm not here to look at you. And I'm not here to look at all of your faults and failures. Amen. I'm here to keep my eyes on the sky. Keep my eyes on the prize. Amen. Hey, I'm looking for the coming and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Hey, and if you'll keep your eyes on him this morning. It'll help you. You know how many times I've been hurt through the years as a pastor from the church? I couldn't even count them all. Amen. You know how many times Christians, brothers and sisters, have turned their back, stab you in the back, slit your throat, cuss you out, slander you, I've had it all done. Yep. Amen. Amen. And you say, how in the world do you not quit? Oh, I've tried. I've tried. I understand people's discouragement. Amen. I understand it. Trust me, I do. That's why I say I understand sometimes when people don't want nothing to do with the church. I mean, sometimes I don't want nothing to do with the church either. And I'm telling you as a preacher, I'm just being honest with you. Amen. But I'm not here for that. I'm here for Him. Amen? I'm not here to look at y'all and say, oh, look, look over there. Look at old Brother Ken. No. You look at Brother Ken or Brother Ben very long, you're going to get discouraged. Amen? Amen? But if you look at Him, it'll help you. Amen? And when you get so high and mighty, just remember, we're all in the same ship together. We're all sinners. None of us are deserving. Amen. And the only reason why any of us are or anything that we have is only because of Him. By the grace of God, I am what I am. Right? I don't know about y'all, but I need grace every single day. Amen. You know what I do? I wake up every day and I say, Lord, just thank you for your grace for another day. I don't deserve it. 
but you give it. Amen. You see, the only thing that you and I deserve is judgment. Right? But God didn't. Instead, He was willing to look past our faults and die for us on the cross, give Himself for us, for His enemies. While we were yet enemies. Peradventure would we die for a righteous man. Right? Paul writes in Romans. <laughs> but I guarantee you there ain't many people going to die for their enemies. I ain't. Amen. But it's good. It's a good thing that the Lord's ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. Amen. He doesn't think the way that we think. Our thinking is messed up. If you hung me on a cross and crucified me, I wouldn't be saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That'd be the last thing that would be coming out of Ben Derrick's mouth. Amen. I'd be calling down angels out of heaven. Fire something. Buddy, I'd be getting me some. But here's the Lord on the cross, crucified, beaten, and whipped, and mocked, clothes parted, crown of thorns. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Isn't that something? We don't think like that. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. They're perfect. Ours aren't. Amen? Hebrews chapter number 10. So why do you come to church? Well, I don't know. Why do you come to church? Amen? Now think about this. It's the goofiest thing you've ever heard about in your life. Now think about this for a second, okay? Have you ever thought about this? Think about this. Y'all are sitting in here. What time is it? Oh, noon. On a Sunday morning. Listen to some weird dude scream and yell. And y'all are saying amen. It's the stupidest thing you've ever thought about if you stop and think about it for a second. Like who in their right mind would do something like that? Y'all, the Lord's people. Amen. It's almost comical when you begin to think about it, right? So what's the purpose of the church? Notice what he goes on to say, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Assembling is important. Why? Because it's through assembling that we're able to encourage one another, exhort one another, lift up one another, pray for one another, bear one another's burdens, fellowship one with another, love one another, all of the one another's, right? Care for one another. All of those things. We need the church. We need each other. Amen? And as the world, as I just read to you, if statistics are correct and the Bible is correct, listen to me, then we are going to need each other even more and more and more. Amen? 30 percent by 2070. I hope the rapture happens by then. But imagine living in a country where less than 30 percent of the people claim to be a Christian. You think some persecution is not going to come? You're crazy. You say, how do you do it? You better stick together. Amen? Now notice what he goes on to say, and I'm almost done. Amen? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Some has already done it. Even when the writer of Hebrews wrote this epistle, some was already doing it. Eh, we don't need this. We're out of here. We don't need the church. It's a lie that the devil has propagated and still propagates today. And Christians have bought off into it. You do. God left us here not only for Him to be a witness for Him, but He left us here for each other. Amen? As a witness. Ambassadors. My home's in heaven. I'm just here representing my King. Amen? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. Watch this. And so much the more. You know what? As this thing continues to draw to a close, the end becomes near. As that day becomes closer and closer and closer and things become tougher and tougher, guess what? 
you're going to have a falling away. You're going to have those that profess to be Christians, right? You're going to have those that fall away from sound doctrine. And you know what you're going to need? You're going to need encouragement to keep on. Amen. And let me tell you why. Because everything is against you. Amen? Amen. The world is against you. Your flesh is against you. The devil's against you. Everything's against you. Some of you, you probably felt that way as you was trying to get up and get ready to come to church this morning. You felt like everything in the world was against you. Right? Kids won't mind. Kids won't get out of bed. They won't get dressed. Won't take a bath. Won't go to the bathroom. Won't brush their teeth. Get in an argument. Right? Car won't start. You just want to throw your hands up. Right? Y'all ever have them Sunday mornings? Well, I guess me and Brother Carl and Brother Michael is the only three that has them Sunday mornings. Amen. I'm coming over to y'all's houses next Sunday. <clears throat> but you say, what is that? Everything's against us. The devil does not want us. Why? Because there's power. We saw about it this morning. There's power in numbers. The early church, they were all of one accord. And daily from house to house. And the breaking of bread from house to house. They fellowshiped every single day. Amen? And they suffered intense persecution. Dying, getting killed, told to shut up, put in prison, beaten, whipped, mocked. And you know what they did? They stuck together and they drew strength from each other. Amen? They encouraged each other. They prayed for one another. Here's old Peter. He's in prison. Man, where's the church at? They're praying for him. You know what happens? The gate of the prison gets unlocked. Matter of fact, they're praying so hard, Peter shows up at the house and they're like, oh, it must be a ghost. Peter said, I ain't a ghost, I'm here. Well, what happened? Prayers. The church was assembled together praying. You know what I know? I don't know a whole lot, but I know this. Y'all ever seen a flock of sheep? I know the most vulnerable ones are the ones that's outside the fold. Amen? You look at the one that the lions or the tigers or whatever, the ones that they're going to chase, they're not going to chase the one that's in the middle of the pack. They're going to chase that one that's out there by itself. And by the way, the devil's no different. He's a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Right? But God gave himself for the church. The church is important. And it's going to be even more important. Amen? as the days move forward. Well, preacher, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Well, let me tell you, you may want to get your Bible straight and in the right context. Because that's talking about church discipline in Matthew 18. That's not talking about an excuse to be out on the bass boat or an excuse to be out in the deer stand or an excuse to do whatever it is that we do. Amen? That's talking about church discipline in the Old Testament principle that in the mouth of two or three witnesses the law was established. That's what the Lord was saying. Amen? We need each other. But the church is important to Christ. Not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of somehow. But even so much the more, encouraging each other, even so much the more as we see that day approaching. Right? Would you stand with me this morning? It's important. Now, I told you those kids are watching you. You want to know why a lot of kids don't want anything to do with the church today? The church is no longer a priority. You want to know why? Because most parents teach them that. Ball games, more important. Everything else under the sun, more important. And you wonder why your kids have grown up and now church is no longer a priority. It's because you taught them. Amen? But God still loves His church. And He thinks pretty highly of it. Amen? Y'all with me? And so should we. You know what our prayer is? Our prayer is that we would honor the church as Christ does. Amen? Christ gave himself for it. So if it was that important to him, it should be that important to us. Are you all with me? Father, I preach what you laid on my heart this morning. Just ask that you would, uh, Lord, just, just touch our hearts this morning. Touch our minds. 
Lord, uh, we pray that uh, you would help us to fight, Lord, the, the, this, this attitude of, Lord, uh, just unconcern, uncaring. Lord, this lackadaisical attitude, this lukewarm attitude. Lord, we just pray that uh, you would help us to, to stay close to the fire. Help us to stay encouraged, strengthened. Lord, help us to not focus on the world and the wind and the storms and the waves. But Father, help us to keep our focus on you. Help us to stay faithful. Help us to stay together. Help us to stay encouraged. Encourage one another. And God, we just uh, pray that you would give us the strength that we need to keep on keeping on until you come and take us home. And we pray all this in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. As they sing.